Thank you very much, Isabel. That's very kind of you. So uh, I'm Sanjeev Pagani. Um, so what I thought we should do is try and concentrate a little bit on HIV, hepatitis C co-infection for the next 15 minutes or so. Now, clearly, there are numerous shades of gray in terms of the immunopathology, the uh, epidemiology, and the transmission uh, of hepatitis C amongst the HIV-positive gay men. Uh, we won't discuss that today, but what I thought we should do today is look at the impact of HCV in the HIV-infected uh, patient, talk about the bygone era of pegylated interferon and ribavirin, look at some of the data in terms of DAAs coming up for co-infection, and we'll look at this in, in two different ways in terms of interferon-sparing regimens and interferon-free regimens, and then we'll ask the question, is this still a special population, and what do the new guidelines look like? So you all realize that liver disease is, is an important cause of morbidity and mortality in our group of patients. And this is data from the DAD cohort uh, suggesting that as we get more and more people onto antiretroviral therapy, the impact of liver disease in terms of causing morbidity and mortality in our, our patients is, is increasing. And much of this is associated with hepatitis B and hepatitis C co-infection. The problem with having the two viruses together is that this is, in fact, double trouble for the liver. You're all aware that HIV has a direct effect on the liver, that it causes hepatic apoptosis, and it can stimulate hepatic stellate cells to produce fibrosis, but it also has indirect effects in that the mucosal T cell depletion that you get in the gut is associated with huge amounts of uh, LPS in the blood that also stimulates your hepatic stellate cells. And then clearly there is an effect on decreased HCV immune-specific responses that increase uh, HCV replication. And so if you put all of this together, then that doesn't surprise you that these patients uh, get devastating uh, liver disease as a result of having the two viruses together. And this is best illustrated in some of the cohort studies. This is looking at the John Hopkins cohort where they modeled fibrosis progression in mono-infected patients versus co-infected patients and just if you control for everything else, then your patient with a, a fibrosis score of nine will be 10 times younger or 10 years younger than your mono-infected patient uh, with the same fibrosis score, saying that you know, this is an accelerated fibrosis that we see in our group of patients. Unfortunately, this is not just a liver disease in terms of the co-infection. We know that when you have a chronic viral infection, there is a chronic inflammation. If you put these two viruses together, not only do you see an effect in, in terms of liver disease, but you're also starting to see effects in terms of neurological disease, cardiovascular disease, HIV disease progression, and kidney and bone disorders as well. And so having the two viruses together has multi-system effects rather than just um, liver-related effects. So right from the early days of highly active antiretroviral therapy, we found that getting people onto antiretroviral therapy not only reduced overall mortality, but reduced liver-related mo mortality and morbidity as well. And so clearly, heart's good uh, for co-infected patients. Unfortunately, even with modern heart agents, uh, there is still the risk of hepatotoxicity if you're co-infected with, with hepatitis C and HIV and hepatitis B and HIV. And this is data looking at even some of the, the more modern drugs that we use, the boosted PIs and Raltegravir, the risk of hepatotoxicity events is, is greater. And so the key issue here is to try and cure people's hepatitis C to stop uh, all of these effects. So up until recently, our standard of care was pegylated interferon and ribavirin. And this is looking at a, a number of studies that looked at the, the SVR24 rates with peg interferon and ribavirin uh, and comparing this with what happened in mono-infected patients in the red bars. The first thing that becomes very obvious very quickly is that co-infected patients don't do so well with pegylated interferon and ribavirin. But not only do they not do so well, it's those patients with genotype 1 disease that have the biggest problem in terms of sustained virological responses. And so this then brings us on to the directly acting antiviral therapies. So this, if, if you're going to take any slide away from this talk, this is probably the most important slide in terms of the groups of drugs that are coming through and their nomenclature. So there are broadly three groups of DAAs that are coming through. There are the protease inhibitors, the NS5A inhibitors, 
and the polymerase inhibitors, of which there are two classes, the nukes and the non-nukes. And the, the labeling convention for these drugs is Previs for the, the protease inhibitors, Asvirs for the NS5A inhibitors, and Uvirs for the polymerase inhibitors. And so just to give you an idea of the number of drugs that are in uh, phase three studies at the moment, so Telaprovir and Bucepravir have already been licensed as a Semeprovir, and a, a host of others are coming through from all of these groups of agents. So let's first of all start looking at some data with telaprovir and bosepravir. These are the ANRS studies looked at uh, telaprovir and bosepravir in treatment experience patients uh, given for um, 48 weeks plus. And as you can see, uh, across the board, we were seeing better responses than the 30% that we were seeing with peg interferon and ribavirin alone. And so clearly, we were starting to see the, the boat being pushed out in terms of responses to triple therapy now combining telaprovir or bosepravir with peg interferon and ribavirin. This is a real-life experience uh, of triple therapy in the pan-European data from uh, uh, clinics in Spain and Germany. And again, you can see we're seeing much better sustained virological responses, but we're also starting to see issues in terms of dropouts with telaprovir and bosepravir because these are three times a day drugs, high pill burden, and difficult to take. So what about the second generation DAAs, combining them with peg interferon and ribavirin and trying to shorten the duration of therapy? There are three studies here that, that I think are important. There's a C212 study, which looks at simeprovir, plus peg and riber in a response-guided fashion, uh, faldaprovir plus peg and riber again in a response-guided fashion, and then sofosprovir and peg and riber in a small study of just 12 weeks for all patients. And just to show you some of the results very, very quickly, uh, with simeprovir, we were starting to now see 75% sustained virological responses, and it was possible to shorten duration of therapy uh, for the vast majority of patients. What was really quite interesting about this trial was that those patients that were not on ART, despite the fact that they had higher CD4 counts, tended to have slightly lower sustained virological responses. And this is something that we could discuss uh, if we have time later. The start with the fourth study, which was looking at faldaprovir, again showed that it didn't really matter what dose of faldaprovir you had and that it was possible to do response-guided therapy, you were still getting over 70% sustained virological responses. With the, with the Gilead drug, sofosprovir, PEG, and Riber for 12 weeks, again, 90% sustained virological responses, and responses in small numbers, but across the genotypes. Now we were seeing responses across one, two, three, and four. So, so that clearly showed us that it is possible to shorten duration of therapy with DAAs and with PEG, interferon, and ribavirin, but the real sort of holy grail of hepatitis C treatment has to be interferon-free therapy. And so this is sort of data in terms of DAAs combined for co-infected patients. And I'm going to discuss three studies for you here very briefly. Uh, the first one is a photon-1 study, which combines a phosphovir plus ribavirin, um, treatment lengths of 24 or 12 weeks, depending on, on genotype. The C-worthy study, which is a combination of the Merck protease inhibitor 5172 plus the NS5A inhibitor plus or minus ribavirin, this time just for 12 weeks for all comers. And then a really small phase two study from the NIH group, which combined ladiposphere and sofosprovir as a single tablet regimen, one tablet once a day, and again, uh, looking at patients either uh, who are art uh, naive or art treated. At this conference, we'll see data from the photon 2 study, which is the equivalent of photon 1 in Europe, and we'll also see data from the first time from the EBV3 drugs uh, in co infected patients. So watch out for those this afternoon. Okay, so let's just briefly look through the results. So just looking at photon 1 uh, virological response treatment naive, treatment experienced patients, you know, 80 to 90% SVRs, except in genotype three patients for 12 weeks, which we all know wasn't enough in terms of uh, uh, an interferon-free therapy. If you look at the C-worthy virological population and, and intention to treat analysis uh, at SVR4, over 95% 
sustain virological responses with two drugs combined, plus or minus ribavirin, for 12 weeks. Uh, if you look at the eradicate study, this is the fixed dose um, sofosbuvir, ledipasvir, uh, and again these are preliminary data, but almost 100% response across the board. And so we've come on the next step now in terms of DAA-based therapy and response in co-infected patients. So I suppose the next question we then have to ask is: Are these patients any different to patients who've got hepatitis C mono-infection? And I know it's really cheeky to do this, but if you put the mono-infected patients in similar studies side by side with co-infected patients, as you can see across the board, whether it's interferon containing or interferon sparing, sustained virological responses are similar between uh, mono and co-infected patients. And in fact, you can take this one step further. This is the start versa studies, which is the faldaprevir PEG and RIBA studies, and if you combine the start versus or mono-infected and co-infected patients together uh, and, and look at um, predictors of response, then adjusting for all of these other factors, if you were HIV positive, you were more likely to get a sustained virological response than if you were HIV negative. And so not only are our patients doing just as well as mono-infected patients, they probably do slightly better because adherence, I think, uh, is, is much better in our patients across the clinical trials. So on the basis of this, there are now new uh, uh, guidelines for, for treating hepatitis C. These are the easel HCV recommendations that were released in April this year. This is an online guidance. And what easel very clearly says is that the same treatment regimens can be used in co-infected patients as in mono-infected patients as the virological results of therapy are identical. And so for the first time ever, we're no longer the poor cousins of hepatitis C mono-infected patients. And in fact, uh, according to EASL, this is, these are all the drugs that we have available to us for different genotypes in terms of managing um, co-infected and mono-infected patients. But the one thing that we do really need to watch out for is drug-drug interactions. I won't take you through this in, in detail. This is from the, the Liverpool Drug-Drug Interactions website. As you can see, there's potential for a number of drug-drug interactions between the uh, hep C DAAs uh, and the antiretroviral regimens. And this is something that we need to think about uh, when we think about treating patients with co-infection. So, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, the era of DAA-based antiviral therapy has arrived, and clearly interferon sparing and interferon-free therapies are a reality for our group of patients. What's most important is that the responses in HIV-positive patients are similar to those in HIV-negative patients, apart from uh, the drug-drug interactions which we'll, we'll need to tackle. I believe this is still a special population because of the aggressive multisystem disease that the two viruses causes together and the urgent need of treatment uh, immaterial of fortifibrosis stages. But the most important thing that we now need to, to, to address is the need for improved cascade of care uh, and access to treatment. And so I'm going to leave you with one final thought, that whilst OMO may not wash away our shades of grey, DAAs are certainly the answer to eradicating hepatitis C uh, and, and, and thinking about global eradication of hepatitis C. Thank you very much. <laughs>